to you. Hello and good morning. The popular press call it glue sniffing. Its more accurate name is solvent abuse. According to one survey, one in four school children have tried it. Last year, it killed 116 young people. Two deaths a week from sniffing anything from glue to deodorant, from hairspray to felt tip pens. Today, we're examining the problems of those youngsters who are hooked on solvents. And we're asking, do we know what's happening to our children? Wayne, you used to be an addict to solvent addict. What kind of things did you used to use? At first, I started abusing Tipex, typewriter correcting fluid. Then it progressed to butane gas, all other aerosols, deodorants, hairsprays. And then on to petrol, glue, chloroform at school, anything towards the end before I could get my hands on. So you went through the whole range of things. What age did you start? I started just after my 14th birthday, and I was abusing for just over a year. Why did you start in the first place? It was just pressure from friends pushing me into trying it because everyone was doing it at the time. So, so everyone else was doing it. You went along in what, large groups? And At first it was just large groups and towards the end I just used to do it on my own. How long did it take you to kick the habit? When I first received counselling it took about four months to actually stop sniffing solvents. And you're, you're not addicted now? No, I've been off for over a year now. Do you feel any different? Can you, can you say that you're different in any way? Yeah, my lifestyle's changed dramatically. There's no problems at home now. My schoolwork improved a lot while I, when I did give up. I didn't even get into trouble with the police. Um, my friends, they all came back, the true friends, not the ones I was abusing with. And everything just improved. Yeah. Mark, you were also using solvents, weren't you? What kind yes. of solvents were you using? I first started off using gases, then I, like Wayne myself, I went through the range of everything through to deodorants and glues, and I stayed on the glues. Yeah. What is it that happened to you that made you uh, decide that this wasn't for you, that you're going to try and be a normal, ordinary person? I kept getting into trouble, like things I couldn't remember. I kept going to get in serious trouble with the police. I couldn't what remember. kind of trouble? Can you tell us? I was, woke up in the police station one day and they'd said that I'd brutally assaulted a police officer, caused him to go to hospital, and that's when I started to worry. Were you convicted of that? Yes, I was. Did you say they said you'd done it? Do you remember doing it? No, I don't. You'd no, I'd, no memory at all of having... I can just remember starting to sniff and drink and that was it. Wayne, do you get, did, you get, did you steal to get money to buy the solvents? I never stole to get the money. I used to steal the sol solvents. I used to go into shops and used to steal 20, 30 cans at a time. It was just that easy then. Yeah. But what about, what about Mark? Did, you, did anyone that you know who was using solvents, did they tend to embark upon criminal activity to...? We, I never actually stole solvents. I used to steal the money to get the solvents, but I never stole them. You're lucky. You know, you're both here today. <coughs> you may have had something horrific happen to you, but you're actually sitting here as a testimony to the fact that you can get off the habit if you're determined and keen enough. Maria, you're not so lucky, are you? What happened to your child? Will you tell us? We're not actually sure what happened on the day. I don't suppose we ever will find out now. All I know is he was in the park and he collapsed. How old was he? He, he died five days after his 14th birthday. And he died of? Um, uh, Tipex Vina, Tipex Fluid. Did you, were you ever aware that he was actually using Tipex or glue or solvents or anything else? About four weeks before his death, we'd been gone to pick up my daughter and we came home and he was upstairs. He went into the bathroom as so we came in and he didn't call out to us, which was unusual. So we went upstairs and my daughter said he'd been in, me be he's been in my bedroom, Mum. And she said, I think he's been taking something. So I told him to come out of the bathroom. And I said, uh, What's, what, what do you mean taking something? She said, Tipex thinner. So I asked my son, he didn't argue, he said yes. And I said, well, why? Why are you doing it? He said he'd met some children a few days previous to this and uh, he was quite impressed with them. They were all sniffing the, the thinner and he thought he'd try to see what happened. So I said, well, what has happened? He said it made me feel sick. And I said, well, I said, don't you realise it's dangerous? But I've got to be truthful, I didn't realise they are dangerous myself. Most parents don't. No. Yeah. Uh, we had a family discussion about it. I got in touch with the doctor, asked what I could do. And she said, well, 
medically, if it's his first time, it, you know, it's not really a lot you can do, should, but keep him away from the, the children, which we did. We kept him in for three weeks. And he only went out on the Monday before he died because um, a friend's boy had come down from Banbury to see him. And uh, he asked if he could have permission to go out now. And I said, will you behave? You won't do anything. He said, no. But he did. Is there anybody, anything now looking back on it that you think you could have done or anyone you would blame? Or was it Lee's fault? Oh, partially, naturally, because he took it. Also, on the, also, he did come to his senses during that week, I was told, and he refused to take any more on a Thursday evening. And as a joke, the children did hold him down, they poured some down, his, poured a bottle down his throat. So, Lee's partially responsible, I suppose, in, in one way, the children may be partially responsible, and certainly the, the people who supplied them with the Tipex are responsible. Okay. Carol, you also had a tragedy, didn't you, in, in your family? Can yes. you tell us what happened? My daughter, Nikki, she died in August of um, butane gas, sniffing butane gas. How old is Nikki? She was 16. Did you ever know that she was... Was it just that occasion, or had she been using gas no. and solvents before? Yes, she had been using solvents before, um, about 18 months before. But we contacted Alan Billington. Um, at the time, and Nikki had managed actually to kick solvents for just over a year. Why did she do it? Did she? You, you obviously discussed it with her during that period. Mm -hmm. What did she say to you? Um, for, again, it, the first thing was um, through friends. Um, she was the odd one out if she didn't do it, so it was to be in with everyone else initially. And then it just got such a strong hold on her that she, it, she was addicted to it. Was there any signs during the time when she was using solvents or gas, were there any obvious signs of her using it in the change in her behaviour or yes. her manners? Yeah, she became quite aggressive. Um, yeah, well, yeah, she, it's her personality changed, um, especially sort of when she was on the butane gas towards the end. Alan, you run the national campaign for uh, against solvent abuse. Is the stories we've heard, are they typical? Are they? they are, yes, indeed. Uh, quite often the parents that contact us have had maybe suspicions for many months that their children are abusing, um, but often they, they're not sure and they don't want to question the youngster in case they're wrong. How, many, how big is the problem? How widespread is it? We conducted a survey um, in schools. We visited 28 schools. Uh, last year and interviewed over 4,000 school children and we discovered that one in four had already tried solvents in one form or another. Uh, that's one in four of all 15 year olds. Um, certainly as young as 11 years old we had a 10% incidence. What are the consequences of, the, of kids actually using these solvents in turn? What happens to them medically? Does it have a medical effect? It does appear to. Um, we have cases of children where um, they have liver damage um, and problems with liver, bone marrow, etc. Um, but I think there's very little medical evidence to prove that at the moment. Dennis, you're an expert on this subject. The stories, I suppose, are familiar to do that both of our ex-addicts of our, of our yes. mothers. Uh, that's the, the, the normal kind of pattern of behaviour, is it? Yes, uh, I'm very familiar with this pattern of things, yes. yes. Why do kids do it? Well, I, I think there are many reasons. Obviously, that they do it because it makes them feel good or reduces some feelings for them which are, are, aren't so good, like not fitting in with the group or, or feeling anxious or troubled. We've heard that way. several times, haven't yes. we? It's peer pressure. That we, it's, it's just like adults got to go out to the pub and drink, sure, in a sense, yes. I suppose. You, yes. If you don't drink, you're odd, you're antisocial. Is that what's now happening to the kids, that they're actually being made to feel odd and peculiar if they don't go off in a little group and, and well, sniff glue? I, I think it always has done. You know, there, there are pressures on all Because they don't do it the on group. their own, Dennis, do, do, do they? They generally, it is groups. It tends to start with groups, yeah. yes. But what I'd like to say here and emphasize is that these substances are poisonous, that they have toxic properties, which is, uh, you, you know, ve very often not accepted. For example, heroin 
is not poisonous in the same sense as toluene in, in, in glues or in some of the other products is. And also, these products are addictive. And, and it, this is in the sense of the old word addiction, given over to a master or enslaved. And many people uh, find it very hard to believe why youngsters, uh, as, as we've heard already here, what, why youngsters would want to use these products. I think even one time, uh, because it gives pleasure, because it affects the system in such a way, can make the youngster want to do it again. OK, well, we've, we've got two lads here who said it's a, addictive, but they've broken the habit. There are, other, there are others, aren't there, youngsters here who've actually broken the habit of, of use solvents? Yeah. You, well, is it very hard to give up? Well, it's quite hard. I've been off it for about a month now. What were you using? Um, deodorants. Uh, and how long were you using them for? About four months. How old are you? Fourteen. And why did you use them? Yeah, well, it's pressure from friends again. And now, now, let me put that to you. I'm not doubting you, but I want to press you on that. Is that the truth? Is it, is, or is that an easy excuse? Well, that's, they'd, I'd, they'd say, do you want some? And I'd say no, and they'd like, call me chicken. It's like, bully me a bit, and I'll take some. Wayne, is that is it really the case that you're pushed into it by your friends? <coughs> Normally for the first attempt, yeah. But as Dennis said, it is a pleasurable experience. And that is generally the reason why the kids carry on. Are the mothers here who <coughs> want to... Off, off. May I ask the doctor a question? Yeah. What? The two boys have said they've been, on, they've been taking different solvents for a, a, a long time. Yes. As far as I know, my, my son's problem is over... A, a period of four days. Why? I know this sounds terrible. I don't mean it to sound this way, but why did my son die? I mean, what is it? Is it... If a person can take it for a year, is it... Um, a, maybe there's a, a medical reason, like something wrong with a child that yes, it kills? Yes. Is there a, a weakness in that, that child mm -hmm. if they die? No. I, I'd like to be able to answer that. Do you understand what I mean? Of course it is. No, yes, but, I mean, the answer uh, to that is no, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I, I'm a No, but we, we, we do know what, co what but, causes uh, the deaths are terrible deaths that they have, but they're not necessarily related to any inherent weakness or fragility in that person. No, not necessarily, but I, I think here we, we should understand that some of these substances can kill and have, it has been recorded, the first time a kid sniffs. The very first time. The very first the time. Very first time. Well, Th are there that's on record. Yeah, are there other mothers here <coughs> who, who, yeah, who've had children who've had problems? I have with my son, Richard. He was glue sniffing. He, Evo stick, um, fix -o fix And it was a sh sheer living hell with him. How do you find out? Um, well, he had sores around his mouth. He, he just wasn't himself. And what did you do? I spoke to him at first. Um, I just couldn't get through to him. There didn't seem to be any help. And then I was put into contact with Alan. And Alan came to see him and counsel him. And is it working? It is. That's Thanks good. Thanks to Alan. Good. That's one success. But it is a major problem. We've got manufacturers here. Um, we've got Resolve, haven't we? Someone representing yes, I am. Resolve. Yes. Well, what, what, what are you actually doing to try to combat this terrible problem? May I just explain what Resolve is? Uh, it's an independent national charity which has a membership of 80 local authorities, a trade union, and 20 trade uh, and industrial associations. And we provide a platform for all of those organisations to come together uh, to um, share um, some of the solutions and, and uh, get information as to how to tackle the problems of solvent abuse. So you've got a platform, what are you yes. actually doing to tackle them? Well, um, we feel that the first and foremost area is providing sound information for all those who are involved with the problem because I think as has come out during the, the, the discussion um, in the studio, there is um, a great deal of surprise when um, a family finds out for the first time that their youngster has been involved with solvents. And the very fact that glue sniffing is the word that's used so often um, belies the fact that there are um, 
so many other household products involved. All right, well, let's go on to them. David Roberts, you're representing the aerosol Indeed, manufacturers, aren't you? What have you done, if anything at all, to avoid these horrific addictions and deaths that we've heard about? Well, this is not a new problem. We've been dealing with it for 18 years, and we've talked to authorities about it, and our initial response was a very low profile, because in the USA, um, when that problem started, uh, there were about 70 deaths a year. And by keeping a low profile, uh, over the first 12 years, it averaged about three deaths as far as our products were concerned. So we felt that was right. Uh, subsequently, the problem is escalating, and we have done a number of things. We partly sponsored a, a conference in 1981 at Guy's Hospital, bringing together all the people who have a care interest in young people. I think that was a great success because it got people talking together for the first time because there was no one agency that seemed to collate the whole thing. Subsequently, um, we have sponsored publications, some of the national campaigns publications. We've actually produced our own leaflet here. Which is very good. On solvent, uh, very, solvent abuse, yeah, yeah. which we've distributed 80,000 copies to retail trade to help them understand the problem, basically. Yeah, but, 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 going, but that's fine. That's preventive medicine, in a sense, or, or guidance. What, but can't you do anything at all to remove the dangerous substances from your product? No. All products contain solvents of one sort or another, or the gas. So it is not possible to, f to change the formulation at all. Um, we've also investigated things like labelling, but the consensus of advice from all sorts of people, government sources, experts in the field say that labelling only draws attention to the problem and makes it worse. Al, Alan, are the manufacturers doing enough to help? They seem to be. They are doing, I feel, uh, everything that they can. Um, I feel the answer lies in education, certainly. Mm -hmm. Education in, um, in the area of school children, yes but also education of parents and professional people. One area where we need education, of course, is in shops and <coughs> in retailing. What, what's the law? Gordon, you represent the uh, Shopkeepers Association here today. The, uh, what the is law the law? is under the 1985 Act. Which says what? Solvent abuse. Now, uh, what, is it, what does the law actually say? They're not allowed to sell it. But, of course, uh, there are some of those yes, can, 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 can we get that clear? Do you know what the yeah, law says? No, 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 I'm asking our friend here. Do you know what the law... You're, you're representing shopkeepers. Yes. The law was passed last year. Last year. Saying to whom you can and cannot sell solvents. Yes. Can you tell me where what there's that an law apparent, is? Where there is apparent that it will be misused, it isn't to be sold. What age? 16. Under 16. Is it under 16? Yes. Yeah. Robert, can okay. I... May I, may I come in? Yes. Um, the uh, legislation is actually the Intoxicating Substances Supply Act of 1985, and what it says um, is very important because it says that it's an offence for any person to supply, not sell, but supply, okay. any other person um, under the age of 18, or if he's believed that he's under the age of 18, with a substance, and that could be any substance, if he knows or believes that that substance or its fumes are going to be used to intoxicate. Fine. Let's, we've got that clear. We've got someone who knows that it's actually a reasonable belief, but, but that, no, yeah, which, is, which, is, right. which is absolutely yeah, crucial yeah, and, and, and important. Ken Peters, mm. uh, you know the law, obviously. Well, I, I know. Um, I, I you, 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 you see the importance of the concept I, of reasonableness. I see the importance what? of it. I see the, also the uh, fact that um, it is straight away a law which is... Uh, um, surrounded by qualifications, you know, if you have reason to believe, and, 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 and words like that are used. Um, are you satisfied that your members are actually enforcing the law? It is very difficult to say that they are enforcing the law. Let's say that they are, in fact, law-abiding people, and they certainly don't want to see uh, an ex acceleration See, of this particular situation we Gordon have. worried me. Gordon couldn't tell me here at this moment what the law is. I wonder whether he and his members are actually able to yes, well, enforce it. The members have all had leaflets on this particular issue from an early stage. What we're getting is pressure upon retailers or into the incidents. Now, I'm not supporting any retailer that doesn't conform to the law. Let's make that quite clear. But there are some irresponsible shopkeepers, as has been proved. I've been in the retail trade 36 years in a family business. Now, we are part and parcel of the community. I'm in business in my own community. And I, I 
in the conduct of my business over all those years, I've never done anything to bring myself into disrepute with customers or to harm customers by the transactions which we conduct between them. Viv, Bing now, Viv Bingham, does the co-op do the same? We do it by trying to help the people who are at the sharp end, who are actually selling across a counter or allowing goods out of our shops through a checkout point. And where we've gone very heavily is on the training of everybody in that trade, in that store. It's a campaign which is gathering strength all the time. And the new video, which has just been produced by Resolve, the new training packages are coming out into our stores next month again, are all part of a continuing campaign of three things knowledge and understanding of the products which could pe put young people at risk. Knowledge of the law and the skills of detecting potential so you're abusers. So you're saying you're aware of the problem, you're sensitive to it, and you're very careful to ensure that you don't knowingly sell. We are constantly gearing up more and more effort in this area as we have gained greater understanding of the problem and the threats which ordinary household goods on our shelves can potentially be used for. All right, we've got oh, Woolworths here as well. Let me come on, no, let me, we'll come back to you. But I want to, Woolworths is a major retailer and uh, seller of these kind of normal household commodities. What's your policy? Well, we've taken items off sale permanently and temporarily in local areas. What where kind of items? We've taken um, the uh, thinners, the uh, typewriter collector uh, fluid, the thinners we took off sale about 18 months ago. Uh, two of the glues mentioned, we are now taking those off sale. Uh, in certain local areas, the managers cooperated with the social workers, and for a certain period, uh, we've taken a whole glue display off sale. And if anybody wants those glues, they've had to ask the manager for them. Um, we've also produced uh, a training aid, a video uh, for our staff training, um, to explain the problem to them. Uh, and we've made this available to other retailers and to the public. In fact, it's being used by the police and parent-teachers groups. OK, well, here we have a picture of eminently reasonable, law-abiding, sensible, wanting to do the right thing, shopkeepers, retailers. We actually conducted our own survey just to see how effective these guidelines are in practice. We sent our volunteer, 10-year-old Peter Gillam, along to several shops in South London and asked him to try and buy a selection of solvents. His first port of call was a local stationer's. No problem here. Peter came out with a bottle of Tipex and a tube of glue. Next, Peter went to the co-op. They sold him five cans of aerosol with no trouble at all. Next, he tried the local Woolworths. Although they had warning stickers all over the store, they still sold him two large tubes of Bostic glue and a large bottle of paint stripper with no questions asked. The next shop, a supermarket, did ask Peter who the butane gas was for, but they let him have it when he replied that it was for his mother. Peter then bought butane gas again from a nearby drugstore. This time, no one asked any questions. The only time that Peter was refused was when he tried to buy butane gas at the chemist. He'd already bought two cans of aerosol with no trouble, but they told him he was too young for the butane gas. Altogether, in only one hour, Peter managed to pick up a massive haul of aerosols, glue, butane gas and paint stripper. Well, we've got Peter here with us now. He's coming with a selection, a selection of what he actually... Hello, Peter. He did a, had a big shopping spree on Saturday. This is a selection. I emphasise that because for safety reasons, we're not allowed to bring more than six <coughs> aerosols into the studio at a time. That's a big haul. Did you... How many shops did you go to? Uh, seven. Seven. How many refused you to sell one. you these things? Just one. Just, just one. Mm. Peter, did you find it very easy to get the solvents and the gas and the glue? Yeah, very easy. Is it easier now than it... Can you hold up for me? Is it easier now than it used to be? Is it? Uh, yeah. It is easier? Yes. Do you, your friends find it easier too? Mm. Yeah. You used to sniff glue, didn't you? Yes. You don't now? No. And you're not going to do it ever again? No. However easy you find it to get them from the shops? Mm. Thanks for coming along. Thanks, Peter. Mm. I think we have to go to Woolworths, don't we? How do you respond to that? There's a young, vulnerable ten-year-old finding it very easy to get... Um, it is very difficult. I mean, in our training aid, we recognise the problem. 
we are, for the first time probably, telling our staff not to sell goods, which is our job to sell goods. Um, I but you've got warning signs up, you've done the video, yes. you've done everything yes. else, and yet here we do, quite randomly, we send a 10-year-old who's actually abused solvents, and he has no problems at all. Why, what's going wrong? Well, I can only presume that our training isn't getting through to the staff in that store. What are you going to do about it? Well, if you like to tell me the store, I'll go back to that store and, and see that the training message goes through personally. You, can you tell me that a 10-year-old glue sniffer won't be able to buy bottles of solvent or glue or aerospray in your store again? No. Why not? The only way I can say definitely um, he can't buy that is if we stop s selling it to certain age groups. Okay. What about the co-op? I think we would... The caring co-op. Yes, and we keep on caring every time we hear of a problem. We never s stop and we've got to go back and we take, will take from today even more evidence back into our own training message with our training, with our staff and our new people. But, you know, it is a never-ending problem. Okay. And we've other got people are going to tell us we've got, Well, else. yes, it's, they're the parents. They're the ones with yeah, the have to pick up the, the rotten ends of the Many problem. retailers are parents. Can we just say, of course they are. Of course they are too. Yes. If you didn't have them on the shelves, if people had to ask for them, you could sort of monitor it a lot better. My friend Sherry, the heroin, you can't buy heroin on a shelf. You because well. it, you can obtain it just as easily. Yeah, well, with all respect, heroin is, is, is a drug, as we all know. Same thing. Children are still it's dying. It's yes, but it, it is not it's something that is normally put Ken, on the shelf. Ken, there's a 40% increase in deaths in the last. I agree. I perfectly well understand. If you take them off the shelves and get the people to in, have in, to in, 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 a, in a retail yeah. shop, are uh, many on many cases. You heard examples here where particular substances were taken off sale, but in many cases, the substances used. One is not even aware that they are, in fact, uh, being used for this particular purpose. One doesn't like to dwell on things too much because it only gives f people fresh ideas. How many people in this room realise that, in fact, a lot of kids get themselves high on match heads? But you put match heads. Let this lady here... Come on, we're trying to get everybody into this discussion. The thing discussion. that is really bugging me is we're not giving the kids anything else. I mean, surely they're using it as a social thing. It's a social happening that they're doing together. What are we, as youth workers, as parents, what are, what are we giving them? What's, what are we going to substitute this with? Because that's what it's all about. It's no good saying, take it off the shelves, do this, do that. We've, there's a need, and we've got to fulfil the need of those children in one way or another. Barry? I think the parents that have uh, spoken now have um, said what I wanted to say when you were emphasising the role of the retailer. I think it's very unfortunate um, in one respect that the legislation has tried to solve this problem through the retail end when um, parents themselves um, are in quite considerable ignorance about these products because if they weren't available in the shops to youngsters because of some change in the legislation they would still be all around the house. These are safe, everyday household products which we all use. That is the problem. So we're, we're talking about solvent abuse here on Day to Day today. We're talk looking at some of the addiction problems, some, some of the parents, the problems they face, and seeing what retailers, manufacturers and others perhaps can do to deal with this horrendous problem. But one of the difficulties, surely, is the fact, Maria, that the things that the kids are buying and abusing are ordinary, straightforward, household things that you and I buy every day. How can we expect our retailers to know whether a kid is coming to buy something properly for himself or his parents, or whether he's buying something that's going to be, he's going to abuse and kill him? Somebody's just said that um, it is a social problem, as this lady said. When our children go out now, it's not like when I was when I was 13, 14, I could go and play in the street and I'd be perfectly safe. You can't allow your children on the streets. There's not enough clubs for them to go to. Overnight, if you, unless you want to send them to the pictures, and you can't keep sending them to the pictures every night, where can our children go? So they have picked up this habit. Now, when my son died, it wasn't until my son died that I'd, I'd become aware that last year 116 children died. I never read about 116 children dying. Oh. Mm. We've all got to, got to be educated uh, with, well, uh, with solvent abuse. But you're saying, why should they, the shopkeepers take all the pressure? They're not taking all the pressure. They're under no more pressure than I am. 
They're not under after yeah. pressure that I'm yeah. in. All right, well, but let's what I'm share saying is, all right, we share the pressure. Yeah. But when a child, like that little boy, can go in a shop after all the publicity <clears throat> there's been, yeah. before my son's death and since, this is, yeah. there's the, all the publicity. You can't plead mm. ignorance. No. Those children are going in there and just getting it. Richard, is the We're answer a now. total ban? I mean, the, our friend from Woolworths almost got to, got to that. He didn't suggest it, but he said that was the only way he could properly deal with the problem. Is that the answer? Do we have well, to go that far? That would be very difficult. I mean, you yourself, when you were an MP, spoke in a debate on the Intoxicating Substances Supply Act and acknowledged with most other MPs that this was the, controlling the supply was only one small mm. contribution to dealing with this problem. I mean, retailers have certainly got to work a bit harder at it. And I think part of the problem is many of them still see it just as glue sniffing and not uh, the whole range of okay. substances. Okay, well, if, the, if, if, the, if we can't deal with it from the shopkeepers end, can, do, can we oh, deal with we it in the we schools? Do we have somebody here that's from a school? That are, well, is there anything that schools can do, well, do do? Not just can do, they must do, because this is only part of, of, of a much larger problem. You talked about one quarter of children being involved in solvent abuse. I accept that, and it's right down into the primary schools. You're a uh, school teacher? I'm ahead. A fifth of the children we know are experimenting with cannabis. 40% with smoking, over 60% with drinking, all of which they get these materials they also get through the shops. There's a, there's a massive subculture with young people to experiment in various ways. And what we have to do through programs in schools is to, is to deal with these issues very frankly and fully. And we perhaps haven't done it so much as we should have done in the past. We're just beginning within the schools to do that. Mm. I wonder. I'm Maria Stolter, right? Um, I'm going back to the point about how can shopkeepers know. My brother went into the shop and bought several bottles of uh, Tipex Thinner. Now, you don't use one bottle yeah. within six yeah. months, let alone <coughs> six or seven bottles. They have got a responsibility. They are adults. As I said, they are parents. Mm -hmm. and. I don't see why parents should have to take the full responsibility because when they're out of the house, the shopkeepers are as much responsible as the parents. I think the court wants to answer that. I, I think the point... <laughs> I accept the point, and this is the very reason why, with Resolve, a number of us have got together and are quite deliberately sharing across the retail industry new material, making this very point about unusual patterns of purchase. The very thing you say, if people come in and ask for 12 aerosols. Now, it isn't going to stop anybody selling that number tomorrow, but it, please believe us, we are working very hard to get that. All right, he's remedy. doing his bit. Is there more that could have been done in school, Wayne? Could, you, could the school have helped? Is schools failing? Young yeah, people? in my school, it was a grammar school, and there are very few of them left in the country. We had no drug education, solvents, or anything like that. Uh, I must point out just recently, as my work as a solvent abuse counsellor, I've been invited into primary schools to do talks and yeah. response I got from the kids there was absolutely tremendous. Mark, could you have been helped at school? Is there anything the school could have done to have stopped you being addicted? <coughs> they could have at least sort of warned us about the dangers of solvent abuse. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Well, there's my son here and he's just going on to Which the Which is your son? Carl Copas. Mm. He was an addict. And he's come off it for well, about a year or so now. He's on the campaign with Alan. The school haven't done nothing to help him. When I phoned the school up about him, <coughs> and they just turned around and said, well, keep him home, take him to the doctor. When he's better, bring him back. Dennis, is it the school's job? I think schools could become more <coughs> caring places. And I say that advisedly. I've taught in schools as well. But I know when the young people come to me for some help, asking for help, which they desperately need, what we have to do is often to teach them how to care for themselves, how to respond to their own feelings. <coughs> what I'd like to say is I think that maybe we're going on, the, on and on about the retailers and how they shouldn't sell it and knowing when not to sell it, and this is all right, but pe the, kids, the kids are doing this because like, adults have got stimulants which are legal for them to take. They can drink, they can smoke, they can do that legally, but there's nothing for the kids. That's the problem. I mean, this is the trouble with the solvents. It's a quicker high, a more effective one, a cheaper one than alcohol. What about the police? Police have an attitude today. Is there anything you can do? In terms of solvent abuse, I think it's a society-wide problem, as has been indi indicated here. What we do is the community liaison officer and or his staff, they regularly go into schools where they're allowed, and they talk on all manner of subjects, including drugs, 
including solvents. The crime prevention officers, when they survey the smaller retailer in particular, because I'm well aware that um, there is machinery perhaps for dealing with the larger retailer, they hand out certain literature which contains the um, Intoxicating Substances Supply Act of 1985, which, in fact, what Barry didn't mention, it came into effect on uh, the 13th of August uh, 1985. But there are positive steps being taken, but it is a society-wide problem. Yeah. Lynn, should we? You're from the drug <coughs> organisation release, which is usually associated with more harder drugs like heroin. Are you? Are we? Are the government spending enough money to educate and prevent kids from uh, abusing solvents? I don't believe that we're spending the available money in the right direction. Uh, a lot of money has been spent in anti-heroin campaigns and other specific campaigns in the sense that here we're talking about a specific uh, type of drug use which does concern a rather younger age group than other drugs. So in a sense, I think we should be more concerned that younger yeah. people... The point can, is can that kids finish? can be helped, can't they, Dennis? If there's any, if there's any parents who are watching this and are worried and anxious or any kids that are addicted because of peer <coughs> pressure, <coughs> The story, the message to them is they can be helped. Where should they go to for help? It's very hard to say. It depends. In our region, they can come to quite a few places, including our clinic. And there they will receive uh, a great deal of caring for the person. Now, this is important. What's been going on here is we've had a lot of talk about the actual substances. Well, I'm so we're well, reacting. I'm, I'm trying to, to give some kind of indication of what it is that can help. Now, tell, tell us what a kid, a kid wants to go and get help. Where should he go to now? Well, he, he can go That's to... That's the problem, uh, is it? You should, be able to, you should be able to ring off a half a dozen list of places. That's shouldn't right. we? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be able to say, well, go Alan to the doctor, go to sons. a parent? Yes. Richard, yes. what does a parent do? What does a parent do? Well, I've been looking at, at the resources available throughout England, and they are very patchy, and Dennis is here in, in Newcastle. We've got a worried very parent, Richard. Service. We've got a worried yes, parent so watching this now. Tell her what she should do. Well, don't panic is the first thing. Fine. Great. Okay. Got... What do really parents do? What do you think should be done? <coughs> We're offering no alternative to That's these right. youngsters. Mm. We're saying to them, come off these solvents, stop taking it, and what have we got to offer them? Mm -hmm. This government has got to put money in where it's needed, in the community, and stop spending it on things that aren't needed, like Trident and everything else. We matter, and it's time that we got the things for our kids. Our kids They're the, the next future. generation. I tried to get help for my brother, not for, for what, a week? And in that week, I had phoned the police, the social services, and everywhere. It took my doctor two days to find somewhere for my brother to go. Now, how, is, how are young, youngsters going to go and find places when there's not the advertising to tell them where to go? What should the police be doing, Inspector? We are, as I say, speaking more with parents. Indeed, you know, in parents, youth groups, all manner of people of that nature. Is that enough? Well, of course it's not enough. I mean, if all parents would work in with the pastoral schemes in large schools, your child has a tutor, your child has a house head, your child has a deputy head who's in charge of pastoral affairs, you must enlist their support and their interest. And if you're not familiar with these people, then it is part of your duty and responsibility to do so. The schools are there, and I know from experience that there is excellent backing up services in the schools for children at risk. Whether the schools are there, the police are there, the social services are there, there's a great deal of satis dissatisfaction here amongst the parents where it counts. We haven't resolved the problem today. Perhaps we won't be able to. Have a good weekend. Take care of yourselves and each other. See you on Monday. Now on BBC Two, in a programme originally transmitted in November of last year, Home Ground follows the story of a troubled teenager and a family torn apart by solvent abuse.
just an example of what I get from Jodie's room every other day. This is what people sell her, 12 cans at a time. And this is what's going to kill her. Jodie is 17. For the past four years, she's been addicted to inhaling butane gas, sniffing it 24 hours a day, begging, stealing to feed her habit. She spent three months in a secure unit and been treated at a drug rehabilitation centre. But despite this help, she's gone back onto the gas. We followed her trail and confronted the people who sell her the cans. Jodie has left her family and taken to the streets of Birmingham. Her grandmother goes looking for her. When the weather was reasonable, she was just sleeping in the churchyard with all the... There's a lot of tramps that they... That's the type of life they want to lead. They, they don't have to be there, but Jodie was sleeping with them in the churchyard. And I must admit, they do look out for her. They wouldn't let any harm come to her. But, you know, I can't still worry with the gas, anything can happen. Jodie is the eldest of five children. Solvent abuse has undermined her health and changed her personality. She loves life, you know, she's... She's just a lovable young girl. She's, she's not nasty. She's very helpful around the house. Um, and she'd do anything for anybody. But the Jodie on the gas is um, nasty. Um, she can be violent. She'll put windows through if, if she feels like it. Um, she threw a brick at me once. Um, she's been nasty to one of her brothers. Um, she's just a, like, like a monster. She's just a completely different person. When she's normal, she wants help. She, pleads, she wrote to her mum the other day, she's pleading for help all the time. Uh, but then when you try to give her the help, she's so high that she doesn't want it. And she... She gets aggressive, she gets nasty. She never hits, never hurts anyone. Um, she'll smash things. She'll never hurt anyone physically. Um, she'll smash things that are in her way. Uh, windows, doors, ornaments, whatever. But she's, she, she, the name Hyde, she's like a Jekyll and Hyde. The gas has destroyed normal family life. Jodie sniffs gas in front of the children, so her mother won't let her stay in the house. Jodie has been living with her grandmother. It's ridiculous. I mean, what sort of law helps a kid to kill herself yeah, slowly? Every, everybody keeps saying that she's got to hit rock bottom. But after a row, What's Jodie leaves. Bottom? Both women wonder where things went wrong. She um, carries a can of gas with her all the time, and she puts it up a sleeve, and she's all, you put it up your sleeve and you sort of do this, and you, you've just sort of got it in your mouth and you hear the hissing. Um, but that's with her all day and all night, and she doesn't. It doesn't matter who's around. Um, she'll do it in front of anybody. She walked down the road doing it. She'll be in the house. Anybody can be there, and she's still. It's it's always up a sleeve. Even when she goes to bed, it's like a dummy in her mouth. What frightens the experts is that more than 40% of first-time users die after taking their first sniff of gas. Butane gas, which is found in cigarette lighter refills is particularly dangerous and particularly lethal. It kills more young people than any other single product or more young people than any illegal drug. That is what is disturbing about this particular product. The Birmingham coroner has seen so many deaths that warning posters have been put up outside his court. They have a heart attack. It comes on very quickly and very rapidly, even on the first occasion that they're exposed to this drug. What happens is the heart beats very, very rapidly. It becomes ineffective. There's no effective beat of the heart. And uh, this can cause sudden death. Extremely difficult, actually, to save their lives. Uh, and most people, of course, die at the scene, uh, away from hospital, probably even before the ambulance services arrived. It's two weeks since Jodie left home. The family say social services won't offer any help because Jodie is over 16. She's 17 and she, she won't stay in the house if she doesn't want to. And I can't let her gas in the house because of the children. So she just won't stay. 
We found Jody on the streets of Borsal Heath. I've got to go now, do I? Are you still taking the butane gas? Uh, yes, I am. What's, how are you going to stop doing that unless you maybe go back to your family? Or... Huh? How are you going to stop doing it? <laughs> she has the can of gas stuck up her sleeve. A message for Tracy? Why don't you just get into a car and drive around the streets and find her? But, well, I have, and we've picked her up and we've took her home. Unless I could tie her up, put bars on the windows and lock her in the bedroom. Well, that sounds terrible, but just to get her off it. But I just can't physically do it. One day she does want help. <laughs> the next day she completely changed her mind and she doesn't want help. And it's, it's just going, it's going to end up, it's going to be too late to help Jodie. Um, I just hope somebody will do something about it before it's too late to help, to help lots of other kids that's, that are going to end up in the same, the same way as Joe. Steve, who knows the drug scene in Coventry, says that youngsters are turning to gas because it's cheap and easily available. See, the way I look at it, right, this Jodie is 17 years old. She's been doing gas for what, how many years? Since she was 13. Since she was 13. See, a gas, right, you can take it for years, and all it'll do is it'll mess your lungs up, it'll mess you up, and then one day you could pick one up, take one blast on it, and you check out. People these days do not realise what solvent abuse is. They think solvent abuse is kid stuff, it isn't. Kids are doing it. It causes more damage and more heartache than anything else. It cost me, at one time, it cost me my whole family. It cost me almost my life. I was carried out of here six weeks ago from the sixth floor by the fire brigade because I was almost dead. These days, when you walk into a shop and you buy one of these, that's 75 pence. What's 75 pence going to get you these days? What, not even a packet of fags, man. That's a buzz. That's still got something. That is a buzz. 75 pence for what? Death in a can. Bernadette knows the true cost of solvent abuse. She runs a guest house, but the joy in her life died six years ago. Her 15-year-old son, Patrick, collapsed in an alleyway after inhaling butane gas. He was a good-looking boy, and uh, he was very fond of animals. He loved animals. He wasn't academic at all. He was good at um, drama. He liked, he thought he would like to go into drama. Um, he had his problems. He had, uh, we, uh, we fought. It was the usual teenage tantrums. So when people say that there are signs with solvents that they can get aggressive, they can get uh, or different ways that you can tell they are using solvents. I couldn't tell with Patrick because he could be up one minute and down the next. One minute he'd, you know, get into a huff and... But that was... that had been happening for two years anyway with sort of teenage mood swings, so it makes it harder. When a teenager dies, the effect on the family is devastating. A link in the chain has been broken. That night, when the police came and they said to me, your son is dead, I went upstairs to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror. I said, your life will never be the same again. And it hasn't. You try, you try to get on with your life. And it's six years now. But still the hurt, the pain, there's always something missing. So I'd say to him, don't do it, Pat. 
We found Jodie Hyde living at the flat of a registered heroin addict in Moseley. Jodie agreed to talk to us. I got chucked out of my nan's house. They, they said they didn't want me there. Um, so I left there. Um, for two days, I've been, well, it's been about 30 hours. I've been off the gas. Um, and I'm slowly but surely getting, getting myself together. It's obviously tremendously difficult to, to stay off the gas, but you're saying that you are being successful? Yeah, I am being successful. I haven't even had a craving for it, not one craving. I got up this morning and usually I don't have a wash or anything, I just go straight out to the shop and buy loads of tins of gas. I haven't had no money to buy any gas, but I had a fiver in my pocket this morning and I still didn't have a craving to get to buy any. And we've just been talking and eating well and, I've, you know, I'm, I'm doing well. When things are rough, that's the hardest yeah, time as well. Yeah. That's when you get that feeling that you yeah. want something. So it's like we sit down and talk to each other. You know, because I have been heroin and I've had a hell of a lot of problems since I've left Bristol. You know, I must admit, when I first met Jodie and knew she was on gas, I mean, me and my friends gave her a really hard time about it. Are you really free of the gas? Yeah, definitely. I've got no cancer. My arms are empty. <laughs> when was the last time that you did take it? Uh, yesterday. Well, I had a few sleeps yesterday morning um, and then I threw it away and I haven't had none since. Most aerosols now contain butane gas as a propellant because it's environmentally friendly. But in four years, across the Midlands, 74 youngsters have died after abusing this chemical. A lot of shopkeepers seem to be ignorant of the law. It's not illegal to sell butane gas to teenagers, but it is illegal if the shopkeeper is aware that the teenager is buying it for the purposes of intoxication. Potentially, the sentences are very high, up to £5,000 per can sold or six months in prison. So far, no such sentence has ever been given. This is William, he's 15, the typical age for an abuser. The brother of a BBC researcher, we sent him out to find out just how easy it is to buy large quantities of gas. been popular, you know, the gas can, my God, we used to sell about three, four whole box in a day. In a day? <laughs> it's full pack means, and some people used to buy six in the pack, some buy a four. Well, you sell them in the packs, do you? No, into packs, they're oh, coming right. six in the bundle, isn't it? Oh, you come in six in the bundle? Yeah. Oh, right. You want to six? You can have the six in the bundle, yeah? yeah. Have you got the gas, mat, uh, the butane yes. gas here? How many tins you got? Hey. How many tins you've got? How many tins you want? Um, can I have uh, four tins? Yeah. Four tins. Okay. How much are they? Yeah. Well, can I buy the, I'll buy the pack? Yeah. You got the, have you got lighter gas? Lighter gas. Where's it? Where's it going? Naz? There. Yeah. You got it in the corner? Yeah. There. Just there. Okay. I'll have some of that as well. All my lighters are dead. I'm skin up the none of them. Can I have uh, four tins? Four tins? Yeah. <laughs> They're $1.29 a can. Yeah, I can. Can you afford the 12? Yeah. Who is it for anyway? Just for myself, the songs. In just a few hours in Birmingham and Coventry, every shop that 15-year-old William went to was quite happy to sell him butane gas. During those hours, he bought a total of 34 cans. We went back to a shop in Moseley which had sold William 12 cans. This is one of the shops where Jody was a regular customer. Kathy, 12 tins, yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. 12 tins, yes, of the gas, wow. of the gas, the pack. Oh, you just took it yesterday. I know. Oh, you've got no more left. I have got, but you're only bought, supposed to buy one or something. Oh, come on. This is the second pack I've bought now uh, in about 24 hours from the same place. Um, obviously, it's not just for filling lighters or anything like the gas is meant to be used for. Just 
We invited Trading Standards to see our video evidence. Paul Timmins from Birmingham is one of the few officers in the country who has successfully prosecuted a shop for selling butane gas. So she obviously recognises him, but she's still willing to supply a large amount of gas to him. To be fair to her, she was the one shopkeeper who did ask a couple of questions, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, she was the shopkeeper who sold him the most. Obviously, it's um, quite a blatant sale of large quantities of gas to a young person. In my experience, you tend to find that the vast majority of shopkeepers are uh, well behaved and, and know of the problems of, uh, of gas and solvent abuse. But the ones that do sell do it blatantly and don't seem to care what happens. Now, in this case, the shop there has sold a pack of 12 for the second night running. Now, yeah. can she really say that she didn't know what it was going to be used for? Well, from the footage, she clearly recognises the, the child and says that he bought a pack the day before um, and to supply him with this pack of 12, um, two nights running, 24 cans, is frankly ridiculous to, to consider that even if he was a smoker, there's no way you're going to use 24 cans of gas in, in less than 24 hours. It's, uh, it's just physically impossible unless you're abusing it. 12 cans of lighter gas would normally last an average smoker six years. The shops we visited say that they always ask customers their age. So, Paul, you were saying this is the worst haul of insane gas that yes, you've seen? Yes, definitely, yeah. I've not seen anything quite as bad as this in the past. Thanks. I'm going to look into it and uh, try and get something sorted. One shop has now decided to stop selling butane gas. We again asked William to buy 12 cans from Ruby Wines. We're from BBC Television. Can you tell me why are you selling butane gas to underage people? Underage, he's, he's bought it before, but and then you know, he's just sort of come in. I go, it's not for uh, you know. So I ask, what did I just say now? He goes, we can get cheaper. I say it's for lighters, 139. That's what I charge him. Did you ask him his age? Yeah, he goes, he buys all the time. And how many has he bought with? He said he wanted a um, pack. A pack of 12? Yeah. But you're not supposed to sell to I, I, that's why I said 18 to... if you think they're using it. I, I, uh, yeah, that's what, didn't I, didn't I, what did I say? I just, uh, didn't I say, uh, uh, are they for lighters? And he goes, yeah. So you think he's buying 12 at a time through his lighters? Well, I don't know, you see, trouble is, the other time somebody bought it, he goes for, for sharing them out, you know. Somebody was in here yesterday and has told me that you were selling them to a 15-year-old girl and that you said to her and that you knew that she was going to be sniffing and you told her not to tell anybody where she was buying it from. I did because I said, you, do you, you know, is it for your need, which you're not supposed to be, you know, it's so under risk. So you knew that she and wasn't buying it for her lighter. You know that people aren't buying it for their lighters. You know why they're, they're doing it. You've had families in here telling you not to sell it, but you, mm. you carry on selling it. Is it because so many people want it? Are you making a lot of money from it? Let's just make the point that Mrs. Verdi has sold this amount of gas to William today. But she believes that he's using it for his lighter. Ronson is one of the biggest manufacturers of butane gas. The industry funds a charity Resolve but they're against restricting the sale of what they see as a normal domestic product. Howard Hodgson, Ronson's chief executive, is a millionaire entrepreneur, but he has little sympathy for the shopkeepers who sell crates of gas to teenagers. The little general shop or the news agent has maybe 2,000, 3,000 different items to stock. Probably would only have a dozen of these in stock at any one point in time. If someone has got lorry loads of, of the things, uh, pallets and pallets of the things coming in each week, then they are catering for that sort of business. Uh, uh, they are no better than a drug dealer. 
Mrs Verdi says that she charges inflated prices for the butane cans in order to try and discourage the abusers. But the regular users have told us that they'll pay almost anything in order to get hold of the cans. I used to sit under the sub buying time um, and do begging there. I used to earn about £15 making, so that most of that money, I mean, I've had, I'd have buy some breakfast with it and then the rest of the money would go on a crate of gas. Um, and shopkeepers were happy to sell you a crate of butane gas? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they was, all they was interested in is the money. They didn't, they knew perfectly well what I was doing because I was a regular customer in all the shops I went to. I mean, as soon as I walked in the shop, they knew exactly what I wanted and they'd get it from behind the counter. But that all they'd say is how many do you want, and that was it. When you look at butane gas lighter refills, there really is absolutely no reason why anybody should want to sell this to a miner, simply because they're not allowed to smoke in any case. Also, when you look at um, the product itself, um, it is being classified as a drug, and we have national advertising campaigns then put it alongside things like marijuana, cocaine, crack and so on, which are all illegal drugs. And of course what isn't getting across perhaps strongly enough is that these are not drugs. These are toxic chemicals and if you use them in this way, they do kill. Way over 95, 98, 99 percent uh, of this product is used for a totally legitimate reason and the reason that it is manufactured, i.e. the filling of gift lighters, metal gift lighters. Uh, this is a 250 mil, uh, this is a 200 mil, this is a 90 mil, this is 50 and we're going to introduce one which is 18 mil. Now uh, medical advice says that 25 mil or under in fact makes it very hard to be in a position uh, of uh, getting the same effect from butane abuse and certainly almost impossible to have a fatal dose. But warning signs on the can were no deterrent, just an invitation to someone like Jody. Gas is just like any other drug. I mean, all right, it's not meant, it's meant to be for household things, right? But, you, I mean, people do, it does sound the can. If you inhale, it's very dangerous or something. And when I saw that, like, that writing on there, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll give it a go. I was always one for, um, you know, trying to be brave and that big all the time. But I don't know. It's, it's a drug like any other drug. It's no different to heroin, LSD, anything ecstasy. It's nothing. It's no different. Right. Today's subject, drugs and solvents. But before we start, can I please say to you, we are not here to say to you, you will not take drugs. What I will say to you is, it is your body. Put into it what you wish. But please remember, it has got to last you a long time. Think before you put anything into it. 11 to 15 year olds are most likely to experiment with sniffing butane gas. They say that one person a week dies of solvent abuse. That is more than people die from heroin and ecstasy put together. Government figures now show about one a week dies from solvent. Look round the room. Out of a class of about 30 people, if you're all taking solvents, you'd all be dead by next year. And we then have one class short at Lightall School. PC Gary Wood is one of the foremost experts on solvent abuse. He monitors all the deaths in the Midlands and is a member of the charity Resolve. He wants the law changed. I'd like to see it more like um, cigarettes, for instance, that is a total ban of sale to under 16-year-olds, where there has to be no proof, it's just a total ban. As long as they know what age they are, and if they, if they feel they're under 16, it should be a total ban anyway. Everybody knows where they're standing at the moment, and children's lives are put at risk. Absolutely. Last year, a 17-year-old girl died in Mosley Village. Samantha Webb from Hall Green was Jodie's best friend. The coroner ruled that she died after an epileptic attack, but Jodie blames herself and believes that Samantha's attack was brought on after sniffing butane gas. 
she was sniffing gas and she got epilepsy as well, which made it worse. Um, and she, um, she was try she just goes into one of these spasms and she just forgets where she is and she doesn't know if she's in the middle of the road or anything and she's just running the road and then she's dodged, tried to dodge a car and she's come really back and she's just whacked her head on the window. She had a heart attack and died. Um, and that's a lot of guilt on my conscience because, I mean, she didn't do it before she met me. Um, and there's a lot of people that still do it because of me. And I just wish, you know, I could get through to them. It's not, you know, it's not right. Good chair, Jack. Huh? Move over. Jody is now back home with her mother. She says she needs her family's love and support in order to stay off the gas. It was very hard before because of the gas with the children, um, but now she's not doing it and she's back to normal with the children and with everybody else. It's, it's, it's brilliant, it's great. Yeah. So at this stage, happy ending? Yeah. <sighs> Fingers crossed, that's all I can say at the moment. It's early days yet, isn't it? I hope so. I'm, I'm the lucky one, I'm still alive. I mean, I've been in hospital so many times through, you know, my breathing and everything, and I've been on an oxygen machine, and I've been so lucky, and there's other people that are, have died from it and people that are still suffering from taking it. And I mean, I've still got chest pains and everything. I do find it hard to breathe. Um, but that's going to take a long time to heal up, if it does heal up. <clears throat> but it's not worth... I mean, gas is just... Something that you fill up your lighters with, not what you put down your throat. I mean, I don't know why I was so stupid to go on it in the first place. I mean, it's caused a lot of people to sniff gas through me, watching me do it, and it's caused one death, and it's just not worth it. One death, um, one of my friends, like, and it, it can, it can kill you if you do it. It can. And it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. First transmitted, Howard Hodgson has ceased to be Chief Executive of Ronson PLC. Good morning. You probably wouldn't think twice if you saw a 12-year-old girl buying a deodorant or a lighter refill like these. That's a perfectly normal thing to do, isn't it? You see them all the time. The problem is that whilst these products have a legitimate purpose, they're also killers. Solvent abuse is responsible for causing the death of one child every single week. Do you think you're going to be the next one of those, Tyrant? Probably if I don't stop. What do you mean, probably? Well, you look at some people like, and they die like the first time they have it, and then you look at other people like a friend who I had, and he's been doing it 15 years and he's perfectly healthy. How long have you been doing it? A year. How old are you? 17. What do you do? Gas sniffing, usually. When? Usually whenever I get pissed off, bored, unhappy. Way out of the way where nobody can bother me and I can just sit there and sniff it in peace. And what happens? Down. Calm down? Yeah, I usually just get all right. What, what, happened? what happens? What do you feel? Disappointed in myself. No, 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 no. What does the gas make you do? No, nothing anymore. I used to feel really great, hallucinate and everything, but now it's just. makes me out my head useless. How many bottles were you doing a day? When I was living in my flat with my mate, we used to go through about 20, 30 each a day. 20, 30 each? We used to just, like, get up in the morning, go to a shop, buy three or four crates of it and just sniff till we went to sleep. All day? Yeah. 
So it's just kind of giving you oblivion. What did that do yeah. to you? It just wrecked my life, really. In what way? Because I was useless. I was at college. I quit college. I had a job. I quit that. I just ended up sitting at home doing nothing all day and sniffing gas and wasting my money. Where did you get the money from? Well, I was on income support, and Mick was on income support, like, so we just chipped in and we got it cheap because we bought it in bulk from the shopkeeper. We used to order it when he went to the cash and carry. He used to get us what we wanted and kept it in the back until we wanted it. I've been to Why did shop. you start, Cathy? Well, <clears throat> when I got depressed and I was bored, I thought I'd just try something to get me out of it. How old were you? I was 14. What did you take? Well, I just used to use deodorants. What did you do with the deodorants? I used to um, get a towel and spray them through the towel into my mouth. What did that do to you? Well, it sort of made the, made me feel sort of like in a different place, sort of. Or... Describe it to me. I don't know. You sort of. Feel... See, I've never done this, and I'd be frightened to do it, particularly in the light of all that I've heard about the consequences. <coughs> I can't imagine what it can do to you. Describe it. It's sort of a buzzing feeling, and you sort of go numb, and you yeah, can't. Everything sort of vibrates. Vibrates. Yeah. Sort of thing and um, blurs and sort of comes out at you. And that's from a deodorant? Yeah. And how often were you doing that, Rachel? Um, about three times a week. But I actually sort of went off into a kind of trip and um, I used to sort of go out of this world. So that's why I done it when I was depressed because it just took me away from this world. In what world did it take you to? I don't know. A strange, weird place. Like um, everything was really strange. I can't explain. I used to see really strange things. And I just, just felt like I wasn't here. How often were you doing it? Um, How often are you doing it? I finished. I stopped doing it about a month ago because I got really sort of scared out of it. Why did you get scared? Um, I was doing it once and everything went like a fuzzy TV screen and um, all blue. And then I sort of collapsed, sort of fainted. And my friend was shaking me trying to wake me up. but. Um, I don't know, I was just really in a really bad trance and I couldn't help or anything and then it sort of scared me out of it and I realised all the toxic sort of waste I was just putting into my body and it's just not worth it. Did you not realise what dangers you were putting yourself in I taking did, these? I'm talking to all three of you. You did. Mm. You did realise. What other dangers tell me then? Um, that you can well you freeze your lungs and get a blood clot in your brain and I don't know, I just know you can die you know, almost instantly from it and it's a... Well, why do it? I don't know. You just don't think of the dangers. No. You just think of what it makes you feel like and you don't care about anything else. But you're aware of the dangers? Yeah, you're aware of them before you do it and after you've done it, you think, oh, what am I doing? You know, I mean, I, I actually managed to stop for three, two or three months after a friend of mine took it once and it knocked him out. And he did a very embarrassing thing, he actually weed himself on the thing and I thought, oh, you know, it knocked him out, I thought he was dead. And it scared me for two or three months. Sheila? My daughter died um, from uh, using Tipex thinners in 1990. Um, that was the first time she actually used it. How old is Emma? Emma was 14. We're looking at Emma now, she's 14. Very like Cathy and Rachel here in many ways. Yes. What that... would you say to them? I'd say there's no, there's only one way. It's just you just don't do it. It's the only safe way with the, with the using any solvents whatsoever. Is um, there's always a risk of of the same thing could happen to you. What happened to Emma? To Emma. Um, I'd just like Rachel, to say, <coughs> Rebecca. Yeah, my my brother died um, four years ago from sniffing solvent abuse, and he had had a break of doing okay. doing this, but. Um, with, when we used to talk about it with him, he used to say that it wasn't um, actually like a physical addi addiction to him, it was a mental addiction. And it doesn't matter if he wanted to stop, he felt like in his brain he couldn't. And he said that when he did it, he would forget all his worries, even though we thought he didn't have many worries, he probably did, you know. And so he would just keep on doing it because it was this mental addiction. And like they say, you know, I, I kept on doing it even though I knew it was dangerous. He knew it was dangerous. So what would you say to Tyrone? A stop. You know, it's, it's wrecked our family because of this. And 
it isn't just what it's done to him, it's what it's done to you. It has. It, it's completely wrecked her family because we tried so hard as a family to get him through this and stop him. And it doesn't matter what we did, it didn't work. And so it got to a stage where to get, to get this solvent stuff, he would steal. We had to hide things in the house. We couldn't have hairsprays, deodorant, anything. And so, um, I don't know. I sympathise with that lady there because I've experienced exactly the same thing. My 15-year-old brother was found dead on the bathroom floor. Right. He was abusing... We didn't realise it. It started as a group activity. We weren't aware that it was going on. People say to look out for the signs, but there were no signs. There was nothing that Jonathan did that told us he was doing that. We had no idea. I'm only 25. I didn't realise that deodorants... How old was Jonathan? 15 and a half when he died last August. I had no idea that these products can kill you. No idea at all. I was completely oblivious. When I started, How did you I, feel? Sorry, Tyrone, yeah? When I started, I didn't know any, that there was even dangerous. I mean, a young friend of mine who was 13, he came to my dad's house and he says, hey, you look a bit bored and depressed to have some of this. So I did. I got some more and a few more and I ended up getting psych psychologically addicted to it. So every time you were doing it, you realised that it was wrong and you shouldn't be doing it and it could kill you, but you well, carried on. I didn't realise that it was dangerous until I was psychologically addicted to it. There's another side to that, which is that the effects can cause a lot of suicidal thoughts, which is another danger on top of, of the, the, uh, the, 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 the effect of, of the drug itself, you know, what it does to your brain. You can... You, you, yeah, I've saved a couple of friends from suicide, um, suicidal thoughts. Do you have those, Rachel? Um, like what? Like Suicidal thoughts. Does it make you depressed? Does yeah, it have that effect? It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So she's right. Afterwards. And Kathy's nodding too. Yeah. You mm. do. Um, it just sort of, I don't know, it's re really good while it's happening, but then <coughs> afterwards you're just depressed, tired, um, you sort of can't really feel sick. It's just, I wouldn't advise anyone to try it because once you try it, you're addicted. Margaret. When, um, my son did it, he'd been doing it for two years, he died two years ago um, through inhalation of lighter fuel. Now, his attitude was, I know what I'm doing, Mum. Yeah. Like Tyron. Constantly, like that's him. what we were told. I he know knows what I'm doing, Mum. Don't tell me, don't tell me what the dangers are. And he told me what the dangers are, but it still wasn't a deterrent for Christopher. You know, emotional blackmail, support from the family wasn't a deterrent for Christopher, and we tried everything. Now, Christopher has um, three younger brothers and a younger sister, and, or oh, sorry, and four Gavin, younger, Gavin, and Gavin. Gavin is so do, sorry, Don't Gavin. leave Gavin out no, of this. No, no. But Gavin, you had to live yes, alongside all this, you know, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And they witnessed Christopher under the influence. They, in, they witnessed him using it, they witnessed the arguments. Gavin? Now, the worst thing for me was um, it totally destroyed my, re my relationship with Christopher. Um, we couldn't get on. He knew that I didn't like him. I didn't approve of what he was doing. Um, I didn't approve. It gave me sore heads when he done it when I was in the room. Um, he done it in front of the children or when do? they were in the room. When you say he did it in front of the children, what did he do? He was just. He was. But he was like maybe lying in his bed and he had the gas in his hand and he was lying down and. and he light a refill gas, yes, a canister, yes, an yes. area. Let's be clear what we're talking about. Yeah, the right? Something gas. you can get everywhere, and mm -hmm. he was using yeah. that. And what? Um, he was he was doing it in the house, um, round about the house, and even when I was in the room, I could feel it in my head. Um, and my my younger brothers were in the room, watching television and things, and um, it, 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 it knew it didn't approve and it what destroyed did the relationship. What did it have upon the rest of you? <laughs> Never mind him. What did it do to you? What did it do to the family? What did it do to the um, atmosphere in the household? There was there was lots of hostility. It wasn't nice. Um, we fought more than ever. I mean, we weren't the best of brothers anyway, but we did, we, we began, there was so much dissension there, we really couldn't get on. Um, he knew that I didn't approve and he knew the effect it was having on my mother and father, but he still... Um, and say, it's more as well, and say, th they know what they're doing, but then they don't know how they act, why they're doing it, because I know, um, I caught my brother when he was sniffing, and I, I'm, I told my parents, 
um, that's how we found out as a family we had no signs at all. And um, it was, it was just Victoria. like the mood swings. It was just like normal teenager behaviour. Yeah. He went, um, you know, that the mu mu mood swings <coughs> that teen teen teenagers go through. That, so, so this is what we thought. We we thought when he's just growing up. Yeah. It's the normal kind of boorish behaviour you get from that's adolescence. It. And, and when he started using hairspray and deodorant more, and he was in the shower more often, we thought it was because he'd got a girlfriend, mm. and he was just, you know, being extra um, clean and you know wanting to smell nice for his girlfriend what's it done to you it's devastated my life in what way um, well I've lost a son that I love very very much um, <coughs> it's made me ill um, the doctors written that the reason why I've got cancer is because of the stress and strain of losing Jamie um, did Jamie understand what his death do you think would have done to you and no, to your family? I, I don't think so because um, one of the times he wanted to go camping and I wouldn't let him go because I didn't think he was old enough to go off on his own with, with, with some of his friends and he just went and the next day when he came back so I spent the whole night driving around looking for him and when he came back and, and you know I tried talking to him I said to him um, don't you realize that if anything happens to you so now I'll just curl up and die and he said, oh, don't be silly, Mum, you know, there's nothing going to happen to me. But they, they, they don't think the that it's going to happen to them. What did you say? The what you say? There's three of them here. He's using them. She says she's not, but I thought she was using them at least until a couple of days ago. Yeah. You still are, Cathy, aren't you? What do you say to these young people? Well, don't do it. Think of what it, it's going to do to your parents. Do you, if you ever your think about lose. what your parents might fear? You're sitting here. How old are you again? Fifteen. Fifteen. And your parents love you and cherish you and adore you and you appreciate what they might feel if what happened to Jamie, to Christopher, to Jonathan, to Emma here happened to you, what you how your parents would be. I don't know. You don't want to know? Don't know. You don't want to think about it? No, I can see why the child that you know you can destroy your life like that. Is it because you don't care about yourself? No. You know, is your self-esteem so low? You know, think of yourself in this. If you're not able to think no, of the rest of your family is, and the effect it has on them, I Jenny. Think the thing is, I mean, the teenagers nowadays, they're under a lot of peer pressure anyway. Mm. And I think because they haven't got much money anyway, mm. it's an easy way to go into somewhere else when they're feeling so depressed and so low, not good about themselves. And nowadays, there is a lot of pressure out there. There is more than ever. And I know my daughter, I was totally shocked. I, mean, I know about drugs, I know about the awareness, I've told her everything. I take her everywhere, I watch her, I, I do everything for her. When I found out that she had been abusing solvents, I was devastated. Yes. What did I you was say absolutely. To I didn't have a go at her because what happened was I didn't actually. Doing that. Well, this is what she tells me, and I hope that she has, and I'll give her that benefit of doubt that she, I trust her, I've got to give her that. Well, all I know is when I had a telephone call from a mother, one of her friend's mothers and said that she'd found a letter from her daughter to Cathy saying that they'd been having a two-tin buzz or something and had I suspected anything? Well, I said, yes, I had, actually, because, as this lady said here, Victoria. deodorants, Victoria, sorry, um, were going missing. Even my deodorant was going missing. I was buying two for the price of one, thinking, you know, I'm doing her a favour. What did you say to her when you found out? I didn't attack her. I bluffed What did you say? Well, I just... She's got to stop. You've got to stop her. She might kill herself, apart from doing other no, things. No, I didn't did you say? say that. I didn't say that. What did you say? Well, what, what should you say? No. It's not just that you might kill, is it? You might go on to other things. This stuff will kill you, eventually. Or it will drive you mad. I was a habitual glue sniffer for two and a half years. Um, in the end, it drove me mad. It turned into a complete nightmare. A total nightmare. I would get hallucinations that were making me run for miles. I was so scared, you know. I, I've had to stop friends leaping off of buildings because they thought they could fly. I myself have been pulled off a concrete subway. I was like flying into it. I thought it was destroying and exploding all over the place. But in reality, I was just smashing on my knuckles to you, bits. <sighs> you don't realise how this is going to ruin your life. You are on the top of a very, very slippery slope. I started sniffing glue and drinking alcohol and I ended up putting needles full of heroin in my arms and it's just a natural progression and you will die. You will, you will die or you'll end up in prison or you'll end up in a mental hospital. 
Oh, I can't yeah. tell you how much how dangerous this is. It, it will just ruin your life, you yeah, know, it will ruin you. Jenny, you yeah. say then, would you say that solvent abuse leads to other things, oh, yeah. Yeah. cannabis, yeah. anything definitely. else? So you yeah. would class it the same as yeah. any other drug? You will grow out of solvent abuse, you'll grow out of solvent abuse and you're going to, you're when, going to bigger drugs. Well, she when it becomes to me a about nightmare. LSD, actually, you're absolutely mm. right. She yeah. said that the next thing she wanted was a trip, mm. but when she decided not to. When it finally becomes too much of a nightmare to bear anymore, He's just telling you, you to shut up. She's telling you to shut up behind you. I can see her. I can see her. And that leaves you with a great big hole that you've created inside yourself, and you have to look for new things to fill that hole with. Therefore, you progress on harder drugs. Uh, without a doubt, solvent abuse is worse than the class A's and the class B's. Mm -hmm. Solvent abuse really slowed my men uh, my physical health down, my lungs. I slowed down physically. Mentally hallucinating, I was talking to devils. Was you like, aware of that? When that was happening, was you actually aware yeah, of what was Yeah, but I was, was so ignorant to, to just wanting the high and from peer pressure and just wanting to be part of the gang. What about the damage? So you wasn't really no, aware of the damage? Not only until after I finished. Like, people noticed my speech <coughs> speeded up. Right. Like, I, I moved fast, I could run faster, mm -hmm. but I didn't realise until I stopped that. I George? Think, yeah, then, well, I. I, I'm a doctor and I specialise in the treatment of people with drug problems and uh, currently have about 54, 55 patients in my clinic. And as somebody m made the point there, although many of them now are uh, being treated for addiction of heroin and cocaine and drugs such as this, the majority of them probably did start sniffing with blues. But that does... Uh, what does that do to you? What does that do to you? Sniffing glue or well, solvents? They are all or... extremely dangerous substances. In they what are way? toxic to practically every part of the body. They're toxic to the brain, the central nervous system, and some of the toluene can pr has been identified as causing dementia type illnesses. This gentleman here who said he was out of his head, he was having hallucinations. If he had progressed further, he could have his whole mental ability would have slowed down. It can be toxic to the lungs, the heart, the bone marrow, you can have blood disorders, you name any part of the body, it is extremely dangerous. And so that's long term, that's as long physical. What's, what's happening to Tyrone? Well, it's a combination of things. I mean, if you spend 20 hours a day getting intoxicated on whatever substance, you're not going to pursue anything. You're not going to make any productive contribution. His education was What's it doing to his body? I had him tested when he was 12 for um, assessment at school through a um, child psychologist at school and his intelligence at 12 year old was 128 mentally and 149 orally. That was not when he doing was anything to us. No, any, any... He's, he's, not, he's not doing anything. He's, he's, he's going down in intelligence. He's rotting his brain. Well, it's, it's not only down. rotting his brain, but it's damaging his throat, his nose, his lungs, his liver, his kidneys. And it can kill. And I can't, it can stop, kill him. And I can't that... stop him off the gas. I've tried. I think I've tried. He's actually been off he's gas and on injecting so amphetamines. Have you had help? Yes, we've got counselling, we've got everything. Have talking you to the been doctors. To a drug centre? We've yeah. been everywhere. Yeah. And you still will not keep <laughs> off the gas. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say to him, Tyrone, you're leading me a nightmare every morning I wake up. Can you say what you're doing to Every night. It's just one sheer What's nightmare, that? dreading oh. for the police car coming down the road or a knock on my door. Every day I go through you this. You see, I think one of the reasons that people take drugs, whether they're children or anybody of any age, is some form of escapism to try and get out of the sadness or the realities which are affecting them. Now, there are other ways of escaping from using drugs. I mean, personally, myself, I like riding motorcycles fast. That's my escapism. Escapism. Well, that can kill as well. Out. What about parents? What about parents are at the butt end of all this? Should parents, can they do more? Should they be doing more? What, what, yeah, yeah, parents should be doing a lot more. But the thing that's coming out over this now, especially with the users, We're the people that parents. have used it, is the fact that it's boredom. You're doing it because you're bored. Now, the parents should be able to pick up on this. Yes, I've, got two, no, I've got two children at home. Hang on, Jenny. I've Don't got two agree. children at home. I'm sorry, I they do not They turn around and they agree. say they're bored. I can't I'm see in this day and age how a youngster can be bored with the amount of activities that there is available throughout. You can't throughout. see. You there can't is see. so much they can do. There is One underlying the problems. I'm sorry, parents. I don't agree. Parents. There is parents. underlying problems. Hang on, my love, hang on, my love. I'll come back to you. I lost If you my get bored, do you go to a pub for please, a drink? Please, 
I lost my son in 1988 for a first time abuse. Um, parents can do more, but to a certain, only to a certain degree. And that degree is to make themselves aware of a what they have, what they have in their own homes. And most people still do not understand the abusable materials that they have in the home. How old was your son? 14. Did you know? No, it was a first time attempt killed himself. Well, Agreed, but there, what I'm trying to put over is this, that if, if a youngster <laughs> with the parents' support has taken on a hobby, a pastime, an activity I that he's going to get involved in, he won't have time to be bored. Margaret, Margaret. Do you realise how well hidden this is? Yeah, I can Do you understand. That with I can gas, understand. No, please let me finish. Do you realise that with gas there is no scent that it is no signs, there's no spots, there there's no glazed eyes, the effects of one can only last 20 minutes, and in that 20 minutes your child, like your son, can be in a bath and have the effects, could have drowned in the bath as many times, and I was unaware, and come out that bath, and he's, he's fully 100%. Yeah, now, uh, what I'm trying what to say is... What's required is parent awareness, what is, is, is more education, okay. Robert, more education okay. via... You know, your doctors, your medical health team, your schools. Parents don't know. She Everywhere. Parents, parents don't know. Parents. They don't realise that, you know, parents what can be used in the Parents do know because if, 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 if on, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like yourselves. I'm a parent. I've got six kids. Yes. Right? Right. Now, I notice as a parent, not only as a parent, as a friend, every little change in the mannerism. And if I see something I don't like, this is my boy here. Yes, he's he's nearly six feet. He's nearly six feet. I'm five feet. Him, I'm not afraid to challenge no, him and say, wrong. what's the problem? I'll go and say, look, you talk to me, because I'm not just your dad. I, oh, I don't want dad don't back, because dad hasn't I'm come back. Dad hasn't child. come back. Yeah. Come on. Now, my teenager had a very, very full active life. He played cricket, he played football. He was in all sorts of activities at school. I, or you would almost say 24 hours a day, he was doing something that was organised. He's still dead from one attempt. Now, parents do? need to be aware of what's in the house. Yes. They need to know where the help services are. Now, if, if local authorities... And what if local authorities have not set up a system of help, and that includes police, social workers, probation service, health, or, uh, health workers, youth workers, a whole network within a whole county working together... I mean, we found in Leicester that the different police sections within the county were working different rules. As politician, I was one of the ones that instigated. We now have a policy throughout Leicestershire, all the services are aware, including GPs, nurses, school, schools are, have all the information. Parents. I think, actually, we should look at prevent, preventative. Instead of talking about what solvent abuse you, um, does do to the teenagers, I think we should prevent these from happening. And I think it's lack of communication with parents. We do want, of course, that's, a, that's an I obvious really thing think to say. But, we, we, but, but what we're talking about is how. Some of my friend here, you, you were responding, nodding in agreement yes. to those behind you, yes. and they said parents have yes. to take more responsibility. Yes. Should know. That's why yes. I was... Well, but, I have but, three but children. But here's Margaret saying, <laughs> you I can't have. know there are no signs. I'm sorry. My friend I here said it happened the I first have. time. And you turn to okay. the authorities. I am not against... Uh, with all due respect to all parents here who have children who are taking solvent abuse, I am saying I've got three children. I've got one of 15, 12, and six, and even the bedrooms are not private. I go I in, agree. I go in and tidy them, and <laughs> I don't care what my son thinks of me. I really don't my think. Mom, I'm one of five, and. Uh, out of my brother, he did. He went mountain climbing, he went camping with clubs. He was not allowed to go on his own, but he went with clubs. He had activities to do all the time. He was the most active person out of any of us. The rooms aren't private in my house. We can go in any of, our, any of the rooms in our house and see anybody in there. But he did not do it in our house most of the time. He was outside with his friends. We tried everything. We did didn't... Can I just, can we I just say well, how we old... We didn't know how can, can I just say how old, how old was he? My brother, when he first started... Victoria, was, let Victoria sorry. speak. Mum, Mum, she's talking about parents, how old, Victoria. How old was ja he? Jamie was actually 15. The first time it happened, um, after Jamie died, I had a young boy come to my house to apologise to me because he said he'd murdered my child. And I asked him what he meant, and he said the first time Jamie had actually sniffed was when he'd taken his, this boy had taken him to someone else's house and they'd held him down and sprayed, sprayed it in his it. face. Now that was somebody so else you that did actually that. did not... Know, you, I, make, I make sure 
um, to meet my, my children's oh, friends I, and their parents. Yes, I I've met always this had boy. done that. I met this boy. He seemed a very, very nice Jenny. boy. We met all the family. Jenny, oh, sorry, Jenny, 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 Jenny. His friends sorry, were allowed sorry. to come in and out whenever they wanted. My house was always yes, full. Same with I had me. five children. My house was always full of their friends. I'd, I'd go to bed at night. I'd get up the next morning and there'd be young Would boys I'd, I'd be there that had stayed yes, the night. My house was open. That's not what I'm saying. You can actually, say sometimes you, they can have too much freedom. Him, even at 15. With me. Jenny, no, has she got too much freedom? No, she hasn't. She's overprotective no. with me. I'm not taking pictures or anything, but I'm seriously, sorry. she watches me like a hook. She watches me too much. I can't. No, that, that, I'm not, not parents. You, I'm sorry. You, it's got to I be watch something my in between. No, no, you, well, you, what? you tell you can, me. My I daughter's can, had everything. I, I, I've done everything I have for her. A, I have a son of 15. This now, he goes away for the weekend. Jenny, I listen, excuse me. Jenny, Jenny. Excuse me. Can I just finish? Um, I have a son who goes away for a weekend at 15. How do you know what he's doing? I know. Because, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I've got the mother. Yes. I do. Yes, I do. You're not there. Well, I'm not No, I'm sorry. I did say I did say to I did say to my husband. No, 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 but you can't be at the disco. You can't I, I, stay there and chain well, them I down. I sympathise with you for losing your child and all the parents, right? I don't want to send but I'm not asking for... All right, no. but I mean, I know what you've gone through, right? Cause I've, worked, I've worked in all the You haven't been there. These you kids, haven't been now, there. This, young, this, this, this young girl here, as Tundra and earlier on, said, I got a buzz and I went numb. But have they ever thought... How numb these people have went when they were told yeah, that they're that. We're talking about the parents now and the though? parents' responsibility. I think we're talking about parents' responsibility. I think we're talking about parent education. And I think that lies with everybody. I think that is an issue for us all. Yes, but I Margaret agree with says that. you can't know. She I makes can. the clear I'm, point I'm there's no signs, there's no symptoms. I'm no, not only talking, talking about, about, I'm, I'm not talking about, talking about, about, talking about signs and symptoms. Yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, a much yeah, broader yeah, range of education. Yeah, yeah. What parents yeah. need to know to help their children make an informed to choice. To be aware. Absolutely. Hang on, please. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big education program. Up from there, when your child is using solvents. I think it's quite important that parents actually do do something about it because I put on courses for parents parents in the Wirral and the amount of attendance we get from parents can be very low in some but areas. But what are you saying to these parents? Do you all got to go on courses okay. now no, no, that's and I think parents should be aware of the sort of products that are used because I go to into parents and they say well I didn't know they could use aerosols. You listen to us. You're supposed to know. know it's you're supposed to know them all. I'm in the dustbin. I know every aerosol can. It, it's lethal to my son. I haven't got one aerosol can in my house. Not one. Right? I know them all and I can tell when he's on it. I can, because he gets aggressive. He always gets a blocked up nose as if he's got a cold. Always. He staggers about and slurs his words. So I know when my son is on it, no, but I still can't stop him. I've taken away gas, I've taken away his money, I've locked him in the house. Mum, can I go work in the garage? Let's him into the garage. Abuses his solvents after that. Yes, you know, I, I have tried my... I accept what you're, you're saying, that your son is doing that, but I'm talking about younger ones. The youngest person I'm working with is eight-year-old. It's all about her. I know we're talking about you, but if, you, if parents what can talk she do? to young Come people... Come on, no, it's easy to say do this. Well, there she is. You're not, not talking in a book. You're not talking in a theory. This isn't an abstraction. She's a real you person with a now? real son. Do you know why I'm here now? I want another chance for him. He, there must be something That's else right. out there for him. So talk to her. Can I say... There are people... She's the problem. He's the problem. Do you do you go and see someone and talk to people about... He's at the drug council. So you are getting yeah, some help. But that doesn't make a difference. Can as long as he gets money in his pocket, he's on the bus to town and buying gas. Can I ask you? Rebecca. When you first found out, could you get help? We couldn't get help. No. No. We couldn't get help, right? No. We we spent months and months and months trying to find anything out about mm -hmm. solvent abuse. You mm -hmm. can't blame it on the home. If you blame it on the home, you can blame it in the I schools think, too because I the schools can do more. I think the doctors know? let me see a psychologist mm -hmm. because I think it's that isn't the only, only underlying problem with we, Tyrone. We that, couldn't get The help. other problem about, is causing this. Yeah. What about the school? She said schools could do more. Can schools do more? Do schools do enough? Do they actually understand what's going on? I mean, no, I've been doing this video with uh, Wendy of uh, and um, before that, I didn't know anything, because uh, the school never taught me a thing. So what are you doing now? Um, I've, be, I've been learning about and doing a video about the dangers of solvents.
But you, but you weren't taught at school. Do the schools know? Do they appreciate the problem? Do they understand the problem? I mean, they probably sort of know about solvents, but they don't actually teach the, the students about anything to do with solvents. Head teacher? I, I would agree completely with what Andrew was saying. There are far too many people involved in education. Um, I'm not just talking about parents, the community, but teachers as well, who are ignorant and they need education themselves. Do you? Uh, no, I'm fortunate that I know quite a bit about it, but I know that... What do you do in your school, then? We have a drug education policy, and every student in my school is educated with regard to... What, the you dangers. tell them all about solvents? Yes, I think what you've got to do with young people is put them in a position where they can make their own healthy but informed choices. You tell them about the good as well as about the bad, because if a young person makes their own decision to stop, you've got much so more you, chance of success. you're in favour of giving them all the information, telling them you what they're doing, the do good it. as well. Do you know that... Rebecca, Rachel, advantage. Rachel over there. Tell him where you learnt about these dr these solvents. Um, off um, leaflets, drug sort of leaflets, and um, I was reading through parent guide leaflet or something, just reading about things, and um, you read about the solvents, and it just told you basically exactly how to do it. And it doesn't give enough bad things; it gives too many good and not enough bad. So you read this leaflet. A guide to parents yeah and it was that that made you think oh this is a good idea yeah. I'll try this and you went away I mean, and tried it's it a cheap way to um, get just get away from this world just, just, just reading things is insufficient <laughs> totally insufficient it's but, very, you, it's, but that it's, was what it's caused it Robert it's harmful you've got to have somebody that passes on information tells you about the good tells you about the bad no. you've got to see things both ways it doesn't matter how many times you t tell a child to not to do it if they don't want to do it they're not going to stop because say a parent or a teacher tells you it's wrong you shouldn't do it that can just add to um, the excitement of it well you mean that makes it more attractive that's yeah, the, that's the both that. so what's the best method then how do you deal if you people need to um, be more educated about it in general um, yeah, I, I agree because um, teenagers don't don't want to listen to teachers or adults. They don't they they won't listen to adults. They'll they'll just like they rebel to against it. Who are they, so they going to listen to? Children, our own age, our own yeah. level. So the only way I think that you think you can get across to them is like what you said. Maybe more visual evidence or videos. Families that happen. Have you used solvents? No. no. But you've, but you've, but please, friend, Je Jenny, please. I but your friend has. Exactly. My friend Jonathan Elliott. It's Jonathan, isn't it? Yeah. His yeah. sister's there. He, he used solvents yeah. and he killed um, himself. Yeah, I mean, schools, I think that they should have more shocking evidence because we had our drug education and, I mean, I don't take solvents, but if I did, I wouldn't just, go away they, thinking, oh, my God, that is so shocking. They, they don't told stress what enough. the drugs were, but they didn't say a lot on the effects or specifically on solvents. But I don't so understand do what enough. we can do. We've got Tyrone there. He's heard it all. He's, he's seen. He's got it. He's had it. Talk, Maybe. Sheila, your friends, Jonathan's sister, and his mother pleading with him there, impassioned. Maybe he hasn't been shocked enough because I. Um, this is an maybe example. I should I um, when, I, taught, when I saw a no smoking video it was really shocking to me and it stuck in my mind and it was like on my level like children my in age group and it really did make me think you've got to be talked to by people you respect and trust and on yeah. your own age level is that what you've got to do schools aren't going to know if people are taking solvents why because like the, the signs <coughs> last 20 30 minutes well does the head teacher know Yes, you, 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 can, you can spot some signs, especially if you know what you're looking for. I can, I can understand the point of view that parents have expressed some things you can't spot, but if you know what you're looking for, then very often you can spot things. Well, most of the... Like, I'm not sure whether my head teacher would know about it, but <coughs> some teachers wouldn't know the signs to look for. Right. And there's, in our school, there's going to... There's lots of places that they can hide, where people can hide and take solvents. And take but you can't watch people 24 hours a day. That's a Precisely. big brother society. What's going to stop? What would stop you? What's the two girls, Kathy? Kathy, what do we do? What do we do? How do we stop you? I have actually stopped doing it. What stopped you? I um, had a really bad experience. I just felt afterwards. I felt really ill. I was all drained of energy. And I couldn't move would you for about a few hours. Would you? No, it was really. And then I heard about Rachel not, you know, going. Funny. Uh, yeah. And you've stopped because of the same reason. So it's only when you had the bad experience that you stopped. What's yeah. going to stop you, Tyrone? Well, I don't know. There's been loads of methods being tried. My brothers have tried beating me up. <laughs> People have tried just disowning me. People Being kicked have, out of the house. Yeah. And I just haven't noticed because, I mean, I've had all my friends, 
my family. I've got to thank them really for trying to help and get off it, but then I didn't want to stop. But it's got to the stage now I do want to stop. They don't want to know. You do want to stop? Yeah. But you want to find a, way, a mechanism yeah. that helps you stop. How can you stop? You're talking to Tyrone. Um, um, did, you, did you used to get depressed? Yeah. Yes. Um, what, what, made, what things made you depressed? Well, mainly the fact that when I was trying to stop, I could walk down the street and people were always saying, oh, you dirty, you gas sniffer. You know, it just ma makes you think, well, what's the point? Why try? You what's your point? Um, you, you, can, you can hang around with, with other people and, and do more things. Can, what, go on, go on, what are you saying to him, quickly? I'm just... What he, do you, how do you stop? Just, I don't, I don't, I don't even don't know. know. What about the, should there be more controls on the shops, do you think? Or the suppliers, what they're yeah, selling? No, definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I used solvents for 11 years. Yeah. And I mean, I was extremely violent towards my mother. My mother never knew, half the time. Because with alcohol you can smell it, but my mother never knew. And that's just so easy to go and get a can of that gas, and there's no So what need. would you do? You've got, we've got two of our manufacturers yeah, here, they're, they're, Ronson and Rizzle. What would you say to them? Look, that's ridiculous, even selling them. What does a refillable lighter cost you? What are you talking about, which is ridiculous? The lighter fluid in them big canisters like that. Well, it's ridiculous the selling them, yeah. yeah. Why shouldn't they be selling them? Because, I mean, if I got a pound in my pocket, I used to just go and buy, well, I used to buy seven a day. John, but it, but it's ridiculous selling them that size. The Tyrone, right, could go and get 30 cans at once. Now, we went oh, to those different... shops, mm. we went to those shops, yeah, and I said, you sell him any more of that gas, and I'm reporting you to the police. I said, he's only 16. He's yeah. talking, my friend in the back was talking about the size. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look, John, John, don't hold it up, you're on sure. They're saying you shouldn't be selling in that size. No, it well, well, should be smaller cans. Yeah. Yeah. It should also be sold under licence, well, not in every corner shop or market. There's, there's, different, answer, there's different responsibilities at different stages within this cycle. Mm. Um, these products have been sold for decades uh, without the problems to recent, really. Um, all the, all the things that the manufacturers and distributors have to do legally are conformed to. Um, there are other things that we do additionally, and there are other things that we're introducing now, but it's a very much a, it's a, very much a consumer demand situation. One thing that I think a lady... So said you're saying you're doing everything you can and you're going well, to carry on selling we, them that size. We, Margaret? No, what, yes, I would like to know what you are doing. What, what we are yes, doing. Yes, and all, what you intend doing. All the manufacturers are introducing products which are smaller products. Um, when is this going to come about? These, these products are actually being marketed now. Yeah. Because you were, you know, these, this request was made to you a couple down. of years ago. You're making the smaller no, product. We, the we, the we argument for the smaller the, product means... Uh -huh. What's the what argument for the smaller product, for? Judah? It's, it's, it's quite the an Judah. expensive product yes. because the, the most of the cost is in the can. Right. Um, this re retails at 85 pence, and I think you'll find that many mm -hmm. of the other. But um, what we're saying is that's less susceptible to abuse. Yeah, but can't well, because there's a smaller quantity of gas inside. The volume of gas. The shape make it uh, a bit more bulkier, so well, that it's one, not one so gets, easily one, hidden. The, there's a number of factors when you're manufacturing products. Um, it's you've got to bear, life, yes, remember? Yes, I'm I appreciate. Suffering. I appreciate what um, people are suffering, and obviously we don't want this to happen any more than, than the parents do. Now, we supply a product that consumers want. Mm. Now, we have, um, as an industry, we've got together and we've looked at the response that the, the learned people have come up with mm -hmm. against solvent abuse. And OK, this is only one of the products mm -hmm. that um, people are abusing. No, it's, now, it's we the have taken... Talent. Yeah, I what, understand yes, that. I what, what, have you done? Done? what have you done? As an industry, we've got together and we've decided... What have you the done? government have come back to us and said, mm -hmm. right, 25 mils is the, the max. market for it? Because I smoke, still a dangerous right. and everyone that I know uses the, the disposable lighters, so how Dispos big is the market for the this? There's about 100 million lighters sold What is it in the UK? Because you can't hear anybody if you're all talking. Sorry. Sorry. There's 100 million lighters sold in the UK each year, that sort yes, of level. Twenty percent are refillable lighters, and people who buy refillable lighters very often yes. require gas and to refill. And the size them. of the canister. Now, the, the size of the canis for canisters. Two years? That, as as, as uh, my colleague here said, we've okay. we've been marketing a product. So you're now making available. a smaller cat. Yeah. That, that's his answer. Can they're trying. Right. They're this trying. Right. Right. How do you know that the, 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 the sales making a smaller can, can to me is not going to make a difference? Myself, I don't think we can blame the manufacturers. I think oh, we so no. We I, do a bit more I, than the I don't think we can blame them. But myself, I think they can do more. What can they do? I think. They should be an age limit. Definitely. And uh, we well, that's, that's the shop. Yeah, but, but, but we shops. should warn that. 
Oh you know, why can't they go out and do spot do checks? Not and have that that's, 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 that's for sure. Yeah, We're talking about the manufacturer. He's, he's saying he is, he is, they're bowed to kind of the problems. They're making a smaller thing that can't be used, abused so much by people like Tyrone or Cathy, and they're doing their best. They're fully cognizant of it, but they're in a commercial world, and they've got to provide the, the products that people want to fill their lighters. What more can you do? Why I, th I think personally, I know you've got to provide the, the fuel for the lighters. Obviously, it's a commodity for sale. What you could do is actually put some kind of valve in that so that there's only so much can come out of that canister right. well, to well, put into yeah, I understand what refill. you're saying, but you've got to bear in mind that these, these canisters and valves and all sorts of products are there to actually complete a refilling um, job with a lighter. Now, the, you're talking about lots of industries all around the world, so the valve is something that's uniform throughout the world. So you're actually saying, now, to, well, you're actually saying to us now that these people that have lost children... Well, have lost their families and children. You're saying to there's us... More that can that be, there's, there's more, more that can, can be done. There's more that can be okay. done. Perhaps now. we should do it. Take care of yourselves. Yes. See you in the morning. This is supposed to be before the show, isn't it? Yes, that's right. When you're ready, then. What are we doing now? It won't take a second. Everybody, two seconds. Come on, come on, come on. If we have your attention now, it won't take long. Can, we, um, can you move to the end of your seat, my love? Sheila, thanks. That's it. Um, this is what advertises the programme. Just a, We're ready. When you roll, I'll do lots. Um, and we've taken some clips from the programme of you speaking, two or three or more of you, and we'll show them, and then I'm going to say, that's solvent abuse on Kilroy in 25 minutes. That's Kilroy on solvent abuse in 25 minutes. That's solvent abuse on Kilroy in 25 minutes. OK, got enough? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. Um...